Live for further details, we return you now to your regularly scheduled program. Let's continue this stuff. Um, and I think it's one of the most important things to do is not to play when you when you don't see a fat pitch. Um, I don't see a fat pitch in fixed income is extremely complicated because I'm I'm in the hard landing camp um, probably sometime later this year. But again, this is so complicated. I'm not willing to place a big bet. And even if I believe in a hard landing, which I do, what do you do with two year treasuries at a sub 4% with Fed funds at five and a quarter? I better be right <laughs> on my hard landing. If I Stan, you're always right. And then secondly, um, you've got the inversion in the yield curves, which would be a confirmation of, of your bias, an independent confirmation. Um, yield curves, uh, the the thing that I think gives merit to the yield curves is the wide diversity in that church, that the, the price on any one day or the inversion um, is a representation of literally thousands of people with very different motives. A lot of them um, are commercial hedges. They have to take a view on the future commercially. They have to seek to protect themselves. So it's not just seeking a profit. It is it kind of is ambidextric. It goes both ways. Um, if I want to own fixed income, and then in the longer end, um, historically, this is easy. If I believe we're hard landing, I'm supposed to own bonds, but they're not exactly a screaming bargain. Ten years at three and a half in, in the U.S., particularly with a Fed that has certainly shown some metal in the last year, but historically, I wouldn't say Jerome Powell is a profile in courage. So if we get into a hard landing and he moves aggressively, um, I could see bonds and inflation uh, coming back with a vigor from what I expect to be a lower level than right now. I will say that the the response to Silicon Valley... Get that telephone. Um, is, is Stan overthinking it? And partly what he describes there was the vehicle where I, I, I gained... Uh, some profit in 2008, I was effectively long the two-year bond and I was short the 10-year in the expectation of the hard landing would see the Federal Reserve take rates to the floor. That happened. And the two-year with its proximity to cash uh, would follow that move um, more quickly uh, and with greater representation than the 10-year, which could be somewhat sticky for, as Stan alludes to, the longer-term fears um, of what the Fed was doing. Was it right? Did it have wisdom in taking rates to the floor so dramatically? And so because of the stickiness of the 10-year and, and the more rapid response of the two-year, you get a, um, a widening. Um, and you can see people attempt to play that in the twos-10 spread today. Unnerved me a little because in four days, uh, they printed enough money that basically wiped out the entire reduction in the balance sheet they had done uh, for five or six months. months. I, I refute that. I think the, the Fed opened um, um, swaps um, to the banking sector. Those swaps are uh, available typically every day at the discount window uh, where banks can go and offer. Banks are a hedge fund. They have these liabilities, which are deposits, and they can be pulled away. You, you know, in a hedge fund, um, my hedge fund, you required a month's uh, redemption notice. And in, in a lot of the big, very successful hedge funds, um, I mean, the Tiger Fund, which has had this terrible uh, regression, is just so painful and so difficult to get your money out. Um, it could, it's a process of, it could be two years, minimum of two years to, to take your capital. Out. The shock with SVB, of course, is with digital banking. Um, billions upon billions were uh, withdrawn immediately with the touch of a telephone. Um, now, when I was talking about swaps, um, the bank has an asset. It has loans to the economy. Those loans are illiquid and it's difficult to call them in. Um, 
the bridge, if you will, when there are funding difficulties is you can, just like we saw in the period 2002 to 2007, you can package a collection of your loans, which are diversified across industry, again, across the size of business, like across household, industrial, financial, uh, regionally, they're diversified. And you can go with, I don't know, let's say, um, half a billion dollar loan portfolio, and you can offer that, pledge that as collateral. And then a big money center bank like JP Morgan might come in flush with cash, and I'll say, yeah, I will accept that collateral and I will give you uh, US dollars. I will give you tenure for you to, to then go on and, and, um, and manage your business. That private sector swap line had stopped uh, prior uh, to the world discovering of the, the imminent demise or and indeed was probably the factor which brought on the demise of Silicon Valley. The Fed therefore stepped in and offered those swap lines is that printing money? I, I take, I'm really in dispute with Stan on that point. So if I'm trying to look ahead and anticipate, I don't have a lot of faith in these guys. Should we get into a hard landing that they're going to hold the line and not do something maybe worse than Arthur Burns? And, and where does it leave equities? Another thing I would ask you to, uh, to note, and I think something that Stan, because he's very US and very Fed centric, ignores is that late 60s going into the 70s was the real emergence of the euro dollar, of the non sovereign dollar creation, taking on a mass like a snowball rolling down the hill, becoming very, very much bigger. And um, banks essentially an unregulated. Um, banking sector unregulated by the need to hold capital and a sector which was willingly seeking risk, willingly seeking to expand credit. Uh, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. And I attribute a lot of the inflation we saw in the 1970s um, to the emergence and the dominance of the euro dollar system, which knocked out the Fed. We will continue. I think equities are really complicated. Um, I think within the equity market, um, if if put a gun to my head, I'd be short the economy to the extent I should something pure like Russell 2000. Obviously, I don't want to go into individual short names, but names um, like that old economy, economically sensitive stuff. But let's just say we're going to have a hard landing and a, and a bad recession in the U.S., what does that mean for NVIDIA? I don't know. I mean, oils and, and chemicals went up in 73 and 74. Staples have gone up in bad recessions in the U.S. historically. What do I do if, with a company if you have a bad recession in the U.S., but it's growing wildly throughout that period because we have an arms race going on in its space? It's not clear to me it goes down. So I think the equities are complicated. I mean, I'd say the one... Sorry, sorry. Um, I think what um, Stan is expressing here can be captured in this chart. This chart is uh, the performance of the S&P divided by the S&P, but unweighted. So the S&P is very concentrated around some of the businesses that Stan mentioned, NVIDIA. Microsoft, Google, there have been no more than 10 stocks, which have actually this year have made more gains than the other 490 constituent stocks. Um, and you can see that historically, when you've had a hard landing, 2009, uh, the notion of hard landing in, in 2020, the kind of Chinese hard landing in 2015, um, and, and then there are ripples of it to today, this, this first quarter, that you actually see um, a now performance in these stocks, which are deemed to be riskless. Riskless in the sense that, like Stan says, it is not, not obvious their economic sensitivity and they catch a bit. Um, when I look at that chart, I think I wouldn't recommend buying this chart, but I think this chart is actually um, a bear market indicator. And I think this chart is on the verge of spiking higher. So let's continue. 